Hi, and welcome to Making Art Work, a series of conversations with artists who are full-time in their field. This week we're speaking with Ruth Franklin, an English artist who now lives in Georgia. She was born in Kent, England, and studied at Brighton Art School in the 80s. Ruth has always maintained her identity as a painter, and has stuck to her own ideas about what makes a good painting. She's continued over the past 30 years to push around paint in her own way, reveling in the process to create evocative and compelling pictures. Since emigrating to America in 1994, she's twice been voted Best Visual Artist 2019 and 2014 by the readers of Creative Loafing, Atlanta's alternative news and entertainment publication. In 2016, she was nominated for the prestigious United States Artist Fellowship. Her paintings and drawings are exhibited by galleries worldwide. You can find her seven days a week working at her studio in Decatur, Georgia, alongside her five studio cats. We asked Ruth about her art and about how she's able to make it her work and what that reality looks like. Anyone can be a painter. It's not a difficult thing to do. You just have to have balls and it's what you're willing to give up in order to become a painter. If you're not willing to give up security, stability, having a safety net, having a pension, having savings, if you're not willing to do that, then yes, it's hard. And you may have to be what they call a Sunday painter and just do it on your downtime. Becoming a full-time painter involves, you know, living a life that you're, you're, you're just basically a hand-to-mouth existence and you're only as good as what you can sell. I didn't really know how to learn how to be a painter, but I did study art in art school in England in the 80s at the height of the conceptual art era, which, so I came up at the same time as the young British, the YBAs, the young British artists like Damien Hirst, Tracy Emin. I actually went to art school with Rachel Whiteread, who is massively famous now and the first female winner of the Turner Prize. I'm not a conceptual artist, never was, never will be. I'm Mrs. sort of traditional figurative, even though it's a bit wacky now. I've always been based in that. So yes, I had, I had some training, um, which I think the biggest asset that that gave me was to introduce me, A, to other creative people and other artists. And it also gave me a fantastic um, avenue into <clears throat> exploring the history of art, different genres, and, uh, I still have friends now who I met in art school 30 years ago, um, most of which are not, are not actually full-time painters now. A lot of them have side gigs, like they're lecturers in art schools, or they, some of them do something completely different. Some of them are full-time painters, but that's a, more of a rarity than the norm, I have to say. So. say if you're going to take a photograph put a person in it otherwise it's boring so <laughs> if you're on holiday go on get your mother in there <laughs> it's like, you know, no one wants to look at that building um well okay well it could in actual fact when I first moved here I did no people I only did interiors and buildings only no people in pastel chalks for, I don't know, 14 years. That's what I was known for because I could sell them. It wasn't particularly what I would say is me or what interested me, but they sold and I did them as well as I could. So um, there's no particular, I had, I had various themes in, in my pictures that I wasn't aware of until I was required at one point to um, tell and explain what my pictures were about because I don't honestly think about it. I feel as if the pictures should be self-explanatory and if you, if you haven't succeeded, then no amount of words is going to make up for that. <clears throat> and you're not a writer, you're a painter, so you failed. <laughs> um, 
but but a, it was an interesting exercise. I was I was I was um, nominated for an American USA fellowship um, for a painter, which I would love to have got. I mean, it was money. Now that would have been nice, but I would have been a USA fellow, which would have been lovely for my ego. Um, it was I was nominated, so I'm in that in that subset of people like Oscar people. Like it was an honour to be nominated. <laughs> I never actually got the fucking thing, but I did get nominated, which is quite prestigious. I think I hope I'm sticking to that story. Um, however, it required me to <clears throat> write a bit about my pictures, so I had to look back over a breadth of time and 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 think, yeah, what you know, why do I paint what I paint? I've never really visited this before. I just know certain things interest me, and then I go. I set about trying to paint them onto a two D surface, and they come out the way they come out. Um, but I did notice some recurring themes: um, solitary figures in landscapes, or groups of people in twos or threes holding hands in bleak, barren nature-like landscapes. Prostitutes, babies fat people, transvestites, um, women pushing babies in prams, uh, faces, heads. Now, I have no idea why these things interest me, but they do. So this particular picture that you just showed me, and I work from photographs a lot. I sometimes work from life, but more, almost exclusive from photographs. I'm fascinated by photography. I almost could be a photographer it would take the guesswork out of trying to technically get something right painting it's a lot quicker way to reach what you're trying to say <laughs> um, but i find photography fascinating and that particular painting was taken from a series of photographs that i took when i was out in la visiting a friend of mine and we were walking around and um i just liked the fact that it was just her there was a dog in it originally, but I couldn't get its fucking legs right, so I took the dog out. I was thought, I've tried to do this dog for about two days. It looks like some strange gargoyle were getting rid of the dog. You have to make these decisions sometimes in painting. If you spend too much sweat equity trying to recreate something to the fact that you're getting stressed out, just, this is the beauty of painting. You can do whatever you want. I have to tell myself that sometimes when I'm painting. I'm thinking I'm getting all wrapped up, thinking I can't get this fucking dog right. And I'm just thinking, oh, I know. I'll just get this tube of white and I'll just paint over that fucker. And then I do, and then it's not a problem anymore. Gone. Invisible dog. Let's, and, then, and so it came out as a bit of a kind of bleak thing. But there is a dog. If, they, if I die and I ever have any kind of a claim, and they go, and we x-rayed Ruth Franklin's work, and there was a dog originally in this painting. Under there, look, you can see a little dog. Strange, but it's not what breed it is. <laughs> not that that will ever happen. Those were part of a series that I'm, because I'm always trawling through old photographs from thrift stores, National Library of Congress, my own personal photographs or family photographs. I um, I did a series of uh, mug shots from the 1930s and 40s and criminals, which I found great. I loved it. These fantastic mug shots, men and women, fallen women, alcoholics, prostitutes, totally interesting faces beautifully lit sepia photographs and so I did a series of mug shots so some of those are from mug shots like Memphis mug shots and just various sort of uh, small towns across America from the dust bowl onwards so some of the things I do are mug shots and then some of them are Ellis Island I also again happened upon a slew of uh, arrivals at Ellis Island um, and um, work from those. So, so, so sometimes it's mug shots and criminals, sometimes it's just immigrants and that, that kind of thing. Oh, and, and that third one is on wood is a smoker. I sometimes do smokers. Cigarettes hanging out of their mouth, in their hand. Um, basically people who are either just, I don't know, they're kind of unseen or, 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 or 
I just like looking at their faces and then just seeing what happens when I do them. Again, I'm not a very good person to talk to about narrative with painting. I'm not a narrative painter. I've never believed or ascribed to the idea that you should come up with an interesting, hip and dangerous idea and then set about painting it badly. I would rather paint a vase of flowers in a completely radical way that is different and interesting than because I see that all the time, people just painting sort of dildos and very sexual or graphically violent things for the shock value, but painted really badly. You know, I, I, I think that uh, you may as well just say it. You may as well just say it if you're going to do that. So that's taken from a photograph, I think that was probably about 1967 or something like that, 1968. And in England, standing next to a French boy who used to visit every year, a lady, a lady who's still alive. She's like a hundred and something now. She lives in the same house and she had, I don't know, she had some French relatives or something and she had this young boy who I thought was rather nice. I think he was called Jean-Paul or Jean-Louis or something like that. And it, had, it was that year, maybe it was 67, there were epic floods in England. All I live in, I come from an area in England which is lowlands, a little like Holland. So there's lots of canals and windmills and reeds and that kind of thing. So it doesn't take much, given that it's low lying, for the banks to burst. And this was just a particular year where everything flooded. And so there was a photograph taken of me standing next to Jean Paul in her flooded uh, garden. And partially because I'm uh, saccharine nostalgic about my childhood in England and partially because I liked the light and it was two people standing next to each other which is one of my themes that I don't know why I have. I painted that. I actually wanted to be a makeup artist for film and television. <coughs> And I'm still a bit of a makeup whore. Um, and I, well, the two things that I thought, I did painting, I did fine art painting, but I did have a sort of minuscule semblance of, oh, how am I going to pay my bills and make any money? And I thought, I'll either be a stylist, because I'd heard there was really good money in being a stylist if you hooked up with a photographer. And it was at the time when Steve Strange, I don't know if anyone remembers Steve Strange, but he was a kind of a very alternative um, music guy on the scene in the early to mid 80s and he had his own stylist company which I wanted to work for and then I also applied to the BBC to become do their training scheme to be a proper makeup artist wig making I had these visions of me sort of applying makeup to someone like Jack Nicholson somewhere down the road which is just as well I didn't but uh, Margaret Thatcher was uh, Prime Minister at that time and she was in the process of systematically dismantling any kind of aid programs for anyone who wanted to do training. So my dreams of being the dream makeup artist were not to be. Um, so I did shows, I worked in a turkey factory, um, which played quite good money actually. Um, I worked in a mushroom farm. I worked in big supermarkets. I was a barmaid in a very rough bar for about four years. Um, I worked in restaurants. I was the manageress of a coffee house. I started, I had a friend who was American. She was half English, half American. And this is after I had graduated and so I was you know, I wasn't, I was selling art occasionally, but by no means enough to support myself. And she invited me to come over to America to visit her, which I did. And her sister and husband owned uh, an art company. And um, I, they didn't really know I did art particularly, but I, I had the use of their car and I crashed it at one point, and I had to pay them back, um, and they discovered I could draw, so I started churning out these Floridian scenes in pastels to pay back my debt, um, and it sold quite well. 
So that's how it started. I started going back and forth between America and England, and I would send things over, and uh, you know. So that that's that's kind of how I started to make a bit of money. To be frank, I hadn't. Uh, you know, I'd never really worked. I mean, apart from the turkey factory and things like that, I never was comfortable working for the man in a, no. any, you know, discipline for any length of time. That's just not who I am. Um, so I never had any money and, and um, segueing into, into uh, just painting full time wasn't really a difficult decision for me because um, I didn't have any money anyway. So it wasn't going to be too much of a fall if it wasn't successful. But as it happens, when I emigrated here, or we emigrated here, um, I'd already kind of, to a certain extent, established a little market for the type of pictures that I was doing and had been doing on and off in the years preceding that. So I knew people would buy them. I knew they were saleable. I knew I could, you know, I could, I could make... A bit of my, it wasn't particularly the kind of art I wanted to do, but it was, you know, you, you cannot afford to be precious if you're going to be a full-time, well, you can afford to be, but you may be poor unless you're incredibly talented, lucky, and connected, and have a, have a trust fund, you know, so, I mean, so, so you have to be a hack when you need to be a hack, and, and match the furniture, and do all that kind of thing, and you ho you have to hope that you can get to a point where you actually are able to do what you like, and if you can sell what you like as well as, you know, w what the public like or your clients like, then you're in a happy place. I start out with a vague image of what I would like to paint. Either it catches me graphically because it has interesting light or weight and then I set about trying to paint it. It doesn't take long for my technical limitations to completely interfere with me producing uh, a sort of tour de force of technical brilliance because I'm not a photorealist painter. I used to paint a lot more tightly when I was younger and probably my eyes were better when I was younger and I actually had some facility to paint quite realistically. But as I've aged, I've unraveled, the work has become increasingly fragmented and um, the only option really is to go with it. So I find that I'll start a painting and Whatever idea I began with, with what I thought that this painting was going to be, is pretty much abandoned within a couple of hours because you get a strange, I always call it a strange alchemy that happens when you're using paint, that it somehow moves viscally and, and rubs up and the colours that, that, that is, this is almost like a chemical reaction. You have to, time will allow you to recognise the possibilities of, 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 of that alchemy that occurs. So the process is very important to me and you can go down a rabbit hole and you have to have courage to kill the painting. You may start a painting and it starts to look quite good and some of it looks realistic and you think, oh, I did that head really well and I like the way the light's behind it, but if you can't resolve the whole thing within the four corners of that picture on a 2D surface, then you may as well give up because you can't have a half assed painting that only works in one corner. It has to work as a whole. I mean, I was at a period of time in my life where I'd split up from my daughter's father and um, it was a difficult time. I had lived for a small amount of time in Barcelona prior to coming here. Um, and I, you know, I was fairly depressed and I was, I felt hamstringed by the fact that I was a single parent of a very young daughter, so it would have been difficult for me to go out and get a regular job anyway. Um, and art obviously was something that I always done, so I met my husband when I had come on one of my trips 
And I initially thought it would be impossible to actually, I mean, it would be difficult enough to move over here if it was just me, but the fact that I was bringing my daughter as well with all the issues of schooling and everything that goes along with that, um, I thought it would be impossible. So in truth, I mean, making art was probably not on the top of my list of the priority of how am I gonna get by? It was like, how am I gonna do all this other stuff? Where am I gonna live? But I mean, it helped having an American already here. If you've got someone who already has somewhere that they're living, you know, you can kind of, uh, you, you can kind of have a little bit, but as regards the work, I mean, I, I'd, I'd had a measure of success or rather my husband had had a measure of success because he had been the person who'd been selling my art before he even met me. Um, so we knew there was a market out there, so I kind of hit the ground running, really. I mean, as soon as I'd established all those other parameters and got everything in place, I just it was just a case of going out and getting equipment and just knocking those babies out, which we did, and then he obviously sold them, and we were okay. And I did that for many, many years. explained earlier between America and England working in this on and off for this company print company Sean was selling artwork from that print company so he actually had been selling pictures that I'd sent over from places like Barcelona and England without knowing me and he did actually he has told me <laughs> that he actually thought oh I wonder what she's like <laughs> this artist so we eventually met on one of the times that I was coming over to do New York Expo and um, we hit it off and sort of had a transatlantic romance going and that's how it sort of came to be that we formulated this idea that would it be possible for me to be able to actually emigrate with my daughter, which seemed outlandish at the time. And so, but we did and that's what we did. And then we formed our own alliance and our own company where I did the art and Sean sold the art. So, and we had a gallery okay. also that we started. So what do you say, Silent Bob? That's true, that's true. <laughs> I, I, I sold, sold um, Ruth's pictures um, as a rep for this company out of Florida. I was traveling all over the Southeast and uh, had moved to Atlanta at that point. And, uh, my boss called me one day and said, we're flying Ruth over for New York Art Expo and she's gonna stay with us for three months and you should come down and, and meet her. And it, he didn't have to twist my arm because I was homesick, I had just moved to Atlanta and all my family and friends were still in Florida. And uh, so I think it was love at first sight. Well, I think we just got really we, drunk actually. We did, <laughs> we did. And uh, we all went to dinner and and, uh, and like she said, we had the trans transatlantic uh, romance with the phone bill to prove it because this is yeah. like early 90s yeah no zoom and, and no, yeah. what's up then none of that four or five hundred dollar phone bill every Thank month God. so i had to be a painter to pay for the phone bill yeah. like any creative profession that just because you're doing it, it doesn't mean that you're not racked with insecurity particularly when it's a profession that at the end of the day, you're required to not only, you have to pin it up on a wall and, and bring a load of strangers in and go, have at it. And I'm my own worst critic, so trust me, if there's anything wrong or I don't like any of my pictures, then I would dearly love to get in there first and go, before you say anything bad about that, trust me, I know. However, it's less audacity and confidence. It isn't audacity, it's necessity. You know, you know, in order to, if, if you're doing this, it doesn't necessarily mean that you think you're hot shit if you're doing it for a living. Because as I said, the nature of actually being a painter particularly is that it's even different from being a musician in that a musician plays something and if they're playing live you have an audience there and it's an immediate response that you're getting so you live or die by that or a stand-up comic or something like that and you only unless they record it if it's if it's truly live and there's no recordings of it 
then you only have to suffer for those moments that you're actually on stage doing your art. The painter is indelibly cast into history because it's there on a 2D surface for time and memorial. So you have to stand by that, even when you maybe look back and think, oh God, you know, that's even worse than I thought it was. Or it's, or, or sometimes I'll look back and think, oh God, that's better than I thought it was. How did I do that? I'm crap now, I can't do that now. Um, so yeah, I think, I think like it, if you're paid to do something in a nine to five kind of discipline, that, that takes out the ego really, because you're, someone's telling you to do it and you can kind of go, well, it's not really me, it's not really who I am, but I just have to do it to pay the bills. You don't have to claim it as, as who you are. If you want what you want people to see you as, you can almost like go, oh, well, I'm only, I'm only a bank clerk, but really I would, I'm an astronaut internally, but I'm doing it because I need to pay the bills. Well, an artist doesn't have that luxury because you're... So I can see why you would think that if, you're, if, you, if you've got the balls to do it, you might think you're hot shit. Isn't the case. <laughs> it's just possibly the only thing that you feel that you can do because that's how you're wired. And you just do the best you can and you have to actually, like this for instance, so this is torture for me to be filmed, I can't bear it. And quite often if I have an opening with my paintings, I'm, it's excruciating for me because I'm just so embarrassed thinking, particularly if I, I've done something I don't particularly stand behind, but I have to pay the bills. So I have to kind of suck it up and go, all right, well, this is part of the territory, you know. So that's what I think. And why people want to know, and I'm actually quite shocked sometimes when people who have bought my pictures have said, I just really love this picture, and they say something about what it is. And I'm thinking, oh my God, I had no idea it looked like a green clown or whatever, you know. But let people, you know, I'm, I'm not gonna tell people what they think about it. They can think you, you hand it on, you did it, you hand it on, and it is whatever it is to them. I mean, that's, you know, that's, I'm not, I'm, not, uh, I'm not telling people what they can and can't. I just, I I'm personally am just not particularly good at uh, a story behind it, which I understand in commerce that people like a story. Sometimes, occasionally, I will have a picture which will have an interesting story, but that's probably less often than just me go trawling through weird obsessions I have, like fat people and babies. So, you know, it's just... It's just the word boxers. I did boxers for a while and fighters and things. There's my like boxers there, like that. The main downside of it, obviously, like most people, is the fact that I only make money if a picture of mine sells. I have shows. <clears throat> I had three shows lined up, all of which were cancelled. Um, People come in the gallery, you know. Um, sometimes they'll come here to the studio even for a, you know, a look round. So all of that has gone. And even though we do have, I have an online website and we have a gallery website, um, you know, things were just strange and weird and probably the last thing on your mind as it was in the recession in 2007. That, people that at the forefront of their mind is not, I need to buy a painting. So, so that's that. So that's been very, very difficult from a financial standpoint. However, as I mentioned before, when you make the decision to become a painter, um, and I had not been really in a nine to five job before that, I'd been bouncing around. You don't have so far to fall because you're used to living this strange lifestyle, which is pretty much feast or famine, hand to mouth. So you have chops in that area. I mean, obviously it makes it 10 times worse and you have nothing to fall back on. So that's a very difficult thing. Um, as regards all the other stuff, as you said, working alone as I do, I'm fairly antisocial. People irritate me. I like animals. 
I like trees. I like insects. I like having no aeroplanes and less cars. So all of that's been fucking great. And I like it and I wish it was just like that all the time. Um, I don't miss going out because I never really went out anyway. I don't miss going to live music or live crowds because I hate that kind of stuff. So all of that is fine. It's just the money. The schedule really hasn't changed. Ruth and I were both working as we always have done, just uh, not making any money at it anymore. So um, luckily we have some patrons who have been you know, with us for some of 25 years who've been collecting and we've reached out to them and, and so we you know, managed to squeak by that way because we've sold some pictures to um, long-standing collectors. It is kind of nice actually, uh, you know, not having to deal with the public every day. <laughs> <laughs> You're not supposed to say that. <laughs> you can cut that. Um, but as far as our schedule, it hasn't changed a bit. I think it would be a good thing if things became less because the internet has made everything so global, which has a huge amount of appeal, but I feel it has a huge downside too. But I feel as if the, the best way to combat not only incoming pandemics and the general decline of civilization through climate change is to make things a lot more local. Things became smaller and you had more state kind of uh, arts focuses, countrywide at the biggest, national at the biggest, you know, you could dip into international, but I think the main way that the money needs to go around is to keep it local, support each other, people have more of a knowledge of the artists, that kind of thing. So that's, that's my hope. I don't know how it will pan out. It's just a fucking crapshoot. I mean, who knows? I mean, I think we're all pretty much no one knows at the moment. It's just put your put your goggles on and strap in. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Be prepared. Okay, I have um, five studio cats. Uh, there's a cat colony around here and I started feeding them and, you know, it's part of a program where you spay and neuter them and uh, keep them safe. So um, one, one of them, Do Dolly, who's in the studio now, who's brave, I found, someone dumped her at the farmer's market and she's, a, she's quite a character, she's quite ornery. She, I always look at her as a bit of a golden girl, she doesn't take any shit from anyone and she's quite She's very loving. Um, so, as if on cue, come on. Come on. Um, yes, you are. So that's, that's it, really. I, I, you know, they sometimes sleep in the studio. They're probably wondering why you're in here at the moment, so they can't come in and lounge on this sofa and eat kibble. Um, and it's nice. I love having them here. And they, they're, they were very wild when I first got them, but now they know me and love me, and they... Sometimes when I'm painting, they just lie just in the bit where I have to step back and I fall over or something because they just like to position my, themselves around my feet when I'm painting. They probably think, what the hell is that woman doing? Give me food. But she just keeps going back and forth with a stick in her hand. So that's really all there is to it. You've got to be in the picture. You have to be in the picture. Yes, you do. And you have to, um, I, I can't imagine doing this job if you don't actually like it, if it was ever a chore. I mean, if you ever have that kind of feeling like I'm not in the mood to paint, I don't feel very artistic, don't fucking do it because it will never work. Because you have to suit up and do this job as if it was a job that someone's got you on the clock and they're not going to pay you unless you do it correctly. You have to have the self-discipline. And, and I don't have a, a huge amount of self-discipline except for this, which I'm a little bit obsessive compulsive about. So it's fortunate for me that I enjoy it. And however badly the paintings are going or however badly my pictures are going, I never get up in the morning and think, 
I really don't want to go into the studio today. I'm always excited to come in and explore the possibilities. I mean, and I can work for eight or nine hours and make a huge mess, and, it's, and I'm very depressed that night. Next morning, there I am again, bright. Oh, it's going to be great today. The masterpiece is today. You have to have the hope. If I ever lose that, then God knows what will become of me. Bag lady with cats. So. <laughs>